Hi, is this John? Yes, hi. Hi, all right, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor from stage, film, and TV, the esteemed Mr. John Savage. We're very excited to have you on the show. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, and uh, I'm uh, kind of excited about your TV, or your radio uh, programs that you've got going on. Um, I'm just discovering it. I'm, I'm getting more involved with uh, figuring out the computer world. Um, I'm a little slow, and this is amazing. I've, I've done some, uh, what is it called, podcasts with some buddies mm -hmm. now, and you know, dealing with the uh, veteran, you know, uh, issues that. Um, you know, I've been involved with that stuff for many years, but now programs, just discussing stuff with people with different uh, points of view and doing it on a civil way and, uh, you know, and as far as uh, what the service might sometimes bring out in people once they get home. Well, it's, and, it's uh, a crazy thing, John, because, you know, in this day and age of this pandemic that's going on, a lot of actors have had to use the Internet and, and computers to talk to their fans and let people know they're still there, and in a way, they really get to perform, too, you know. Well, we're discovering more of our creative uh, world. And yeah. I feel this is, you know, very helpful, you know, at a time like this. Uh, you know, radio, when I was a kid, uh, was popular. I was small, but then I remember getting a TV, which was about six inches across, yeah. black and white. <laughs> I think it was four or five years old, and every once in a while, my mom or dad would... Uh, you know, put the put the channel on for President Eisenhower, and mm -hmm. it was a you know large community of uh, people recovering from Second World War and helping people from the First World War. Right. And the issues that they all went through, were, I started to pick up on the discussions little by little, and their favorite stars and people, and of course on TV or in some of the movie theaters when matinees we could go to the matinees as kids, little kids. We'd sit there and watch these cowboy movies. Yeah, they were made maybe some of them, you know, in the thirties, uh, with these great scenes of, you know, these these heroic uh, leading star cowboy, and then the bad guys who were just terrible people, and how gentlemanly the the uh, good guys always were, you know, taking their hat off when they get off the horse right. to talk to a woman, and and uh, just the the real feeling of. You know, physical and, and uh, uh, good uh, emotional strengths that were dealt with in nature and people, you know, in relationships and stuff. And, you know, a lot of shooting and rifles and guns and other stuff like that, too. And they lived those uh, roles, too. We, we were really honored to have uh, the, uh, the daughter of Clayton Moron, who was a Long Ranger, yeah. I mean, they, yeah, and we did that as kids. You know, we fell right into it. Uh, you'd get shot and rolled down the hill. It was really fun. <laughs> well, I, I know, I know that you've done western movies, but also recently, okay, uh, you did pose for our friend Steve Carver, who did western portraits of the unsung heroes and villains of the silver screen. What was that like? Putting on all that garb. I mean, it's not a movie. You're there for a photo shoot, but was that fun? Oh yeah, and a lot of my old friends uh, growing up who were really. Uh, I mean, I did some films with great actors when I was much younger mm -hmm. who were uh, really experienced with cowboy movies. And, uh, I mean, eventually I kind of learned how to ride. But I remember uh, when I, my first marriage, I was young and a and, uh, wonderful lady. She she said, oh, let's go horseback ride. I said, oh, no problem. You know, I <laughs> walked around a, a farm up with a horse, but I never wow. really rode. And we get saddled up. And she had a few months of pregnancy. Mm. And uh, get, gets up on the horse and boom, she's gone. Mm. And I'm like, okay, I'll take. And my horse just took off. I couldn't stay on the horse. I was, <laughs> I was not, I'm not going to lose the cowboy. And gosh, I just I landed on the ground. She came back. Said, Are you okay? I said, yeah. But uh, that was the beginning for me. And well, I'm, let, I'm let so me guess. Good. Let me guess, John. When when uh, you were up for for casting. To be in a Western film, they were like, "John, can you ride?" And you're like, "Yeah, of course I can," because you have totally to always. No, no problem, no problem. <laughs> I, I, started, I, I started to learn. I did pretty good, and eventually, even I worked in some real beautiful films that may not have ever gotten. I think mm -hmm. to this country and places like the Pushta, the plains of Hungary, and uh, the the uh, 
what do they call it? My mind's slipping now, but the men and women who lived with the uh, the horses out in the right. plains and, and used them to sleep, to keep them warm, and lie down next to the horse at night. You could just slide the saddle right off the back of the horse as it squatted backwards on its haunches. Yeah. And I learned about all that. And I, I learned how to ride well before and just playing with the, the idea for years. And I broke a horse on screen, and uh, wow. I did that with a bull down in Mexico. I mean, a smaller bull than a lot of my friends rode, and uh, some of the guys that they st- they've stood in for me in, uh, in films. We, I would suggest you know an actor let the professionals do the riding <laughs> and a lot of the theaters because you know it, it's it's freaking it can get dangerous. Wow! And uh, you need to you need to respect your environment and your horse. And on a on a movie set, I th- I don't think anybody knows seriously who's in charge right so you get a real you get a state of yelling and confusion and you know an actor trying to uh, even in life real life i've learned uh, you got to stop acting mm-hmm. and just you know stop talking and listen especially with women <laughs> you know, it's, it's, well i i i know that like in your early days you had a tough time now you told tiffany something on the phone that i didn't know and i haven't seen in any notes anywhere i wanted to find out Am I right in knowing that you were pretty sick and your father was right there by your side and he was a military man and he was comforting yeah. you, but you were you were pretty sick, right? As a kid, as a, as a small boy, I, I'm, I'm uh, lucky to be alive uh, over a few years anyway, several lucky breaks. But as a child, as a baby, I was too small. Uh, my twin sister died mm-hmm. and uh, uh, we spent I spent three or more three months in an incubator, wow. as they called them, mm-hmm. and then uh, came out and never could breathe, and my lungs weren't built, so I was in an oxygen box. In and out, afterwards, uh, I would have to go back and forth from bronchial illness, and then I got polio. Wow. And my dad, you know, he would he was quiet, and he had nightmares, as I started to hear. He was in the, he was in the, in the core, in Guadalcanal, and he lost his squad, and uh, he was a tough kid, I mean, but he was very quiet mm-hmm. and uh, six foot eight. And I saw him dealing with other people always with a kind of, he would find it hard to find words. And, you know, he may, he may, have, he may have started a, a bit like, uh, you know, we're hearing about our president, Bi- our, for our future Bi- our vice president, Biden. Mm-hmm. May have started, and I hear that in the speech. It reminds me of my dad. Uh, um, and just the idea, I'm, I'm working with guys now who are in their 90s, 95. Mm-hmm. I spend time in these different programs with these guys who were in the Corps and were Army. And they, you know, they sobered up, they got right. And they, they just, they had this quality of experience. And my dad, you know, he had a hand that was in, as my, my babyhood, or four or five years old, if I started to get uh, into stuff, because I still have this trouble controlling myself with my important things to say, mm-hmm. he would lift his arm and his big hand mm-hmm. would slowly come down <laughs> on my head, yeah. right gently on my shoulder, and it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, okay. Or just, you know, the eyebrow might go up. It probably it wouldn't say much. And I saw him deal with life that way because he was not, ha- he had stuff he, he had to deal with right. internally. Uh, and the drinking was just the way it was. And his buddies would get together. Uh, men he would had served, you know, knew that, and they would wives would come over and they'd get in the corner and just shoulder to shoulder with a drink. And I was wondering what they were talking about. And like that cowboy attitude of quiet strength. Right. And, you know, just go over there, stay over there, watch TV. Oh, and my mom might take me away. But maybe somebody would be trying to talk. Like a lot of young men came to visit or were brought in the house from North Korea service. And uh, probably been the Corps from the Marine Corps too and the uh, Army and uh, you know, sharing something. That not always, I you know, even when we went to visit the VA, I didn't hear, and I could never hear words. I would sit there and see all these beds up and down. Mm-hmm. And my dad would be sitting there, and I don't even think they said anything. But maybe that big hand was just on the yeah. side of the shoulder or something. And that was cowboy world for me, too. Right. Wow. You know, it's, 
in that time, you know, people drank and, you know, they died from alcohol or just quiet fortitude. And sometimes not, it wasn't easy. I mean, I saw guys not do well. <clears throat> and, uh, and luckily he made it. And, well, I, I think you know, it was probably strong guidance by your father that gave you a lot of your firm beliefs. I know you were telling Tiffany that you really have strong beliefs in, in taking care of the environment, and you're a bit of an activist yourself now, right? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Because I, I don't always have a clear path, and mm. I get emotionally involved with stuff. And I, luckily, luckily, I've had a couple of great women in my life, uh, including my mom, who issues were her thing. She was highly educated, and she did have a breakdown. But evidence of just her desire to just, she, she cared. Right. And caring, as in my life, I have a phrase, I just say, caring can get in the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you gotta simplify things. Like my dad would say things like, you can't, you can't change the world, or, you know, you gotta just kind of keep it simple. And he, his, his, his communication was very simple. My mom struggled with that. She just, she had issues. She had desire for like changing diet. And new energy was talked about. You know, I, I saw the effort for it. new energy being explored uh, uh, after the Second World War, the nuclear power that was made available. People were scared. You know, we had to hide under desks for practice as a tiny kid, as a little boy maybe. And that was because of nuclear possibilities. And uh, but the idea of new energy is still this this issue that, gosh, there's a lot of things that we could be dealing with. You know, all communism, socialism, terrible. Well, don't we have social and community concerns and differences in our country? Mm -hmm. You know, and those issues were like were being developed yeah. after the Second World War. I mean. We go look at this big field, and my dad would say, "Like, where this is where our house is going to be." Oh, that is so cool! We're going to have a house right in the middle of that great big field. Well, the next year we come by, and there's a thousand houses there. Yeah. Right. You know, well, get those other ones out of here. You know, but there were just quaint little Levittown houses. I was, I remember Blacksmith Road, and behind our house was the first road that was actually built. It just broken up tar uh, just little road that was from uh, from Queens or whatever mm -hmm. it still existed Brooklyn I think all the way out the island maybe all the way to Montauk Point I don't remember how far but it was all the way out and it was right in our backyard and I remember that and I used to walk and I saw places where there might have been a bridge that had been torn down yeah. and new roads were built and my imagination just took over what was that like Maybe it was only a few years ago, maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago. And it was like cowboy time then, I bet. Maybe on Long Island, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just guys riding horses. Well, things are certainly so different now. The thing that, that I wanted to bring up here is being raised, uh, being socially conscious and with the father you had being in the military and this and that. What kind of feelings did you have going into a film that you're really well known for, which is hair? because that was all about a soldier that was enlisted that was going into the Vietnam War and kind of intercepted by a, a group of what they called hippies on screen. Uh, right. and, and I guess you have some issues about how the hippies were portrayed too, huh? There were, uh, for me it was an insult to the young people at the time. Yeah. I knew people who were living in groups uh, that they communicated with others uh, like uh, before the university years were over, though, people like my friend I went to school with, brilliant young man, I thought he was going to be the next Jewish president. But we all loved him in high school, and he went on to do great things. But then at Kent State, he had organized uh, things with other young people mm -hmm. for uh, wind power, solar power, uh, and diesel engines from mm -hmm. Mercedes being converted to use, uh, you know, I mean, converted to diesel. From, uh, and using different uh, fuel, maybe, I don't know what it was, hydrogen, mm -hmm. converted to diesel engines, to hydrogen. I think he was doing that at that time with other kids, young people. And then they had a demonstration that was, uh, you know, kids throwing rocks 
uh, National Guard and National Guard. I, I, have next, I, mean, I think the laws at the time were only three uh, National Guard were allowed, were given live ammunition. Yeah. Two or three. Not, uh, I don't know what they were designated, uh, more aware, but he was shot and killed. Mm. And uh, five mm. other, four other kids, young wow. people. And, okay, so my dad was literally physically sick. Um, I called. I was scared. Uh, I was. I was. I was just angry. Coming home from work after working all night, I, I went to I went to school at Drama Academy and worked all night in the bar. And I came home to two little kids. And I was on the Paris Time now ferry coming home, and it's the front page of his body on the front page. Oh my God! New York News. And I just called my dad uh, as soon as I got home. I said, what? What is this? You know. I don't know. I was just, I was upset. I mean, he had the same attitude. You know, I'm, I understand. I understand, John. You just got to pray. You just yeah. have to pray. Listen, I'm, I'm real sick about this. I'm real sick about this. Because he had brought me in touch with other men and women when I had brought up the question about students for democratic society. Mm-hmm. You know, that was not weathermen. Uh, more active, uh, possibly demonstrated, violent, uh, possible demonstrations. This was students, said it, SDS, students for mm-hmm. a democratic society. Yeah. So he and other men and women organized at synagogue and church for us to have people who knew the laws and knew the changes of laws and knew presidential powers and what that meant and what, what had changed in their lifetime. And uh, we met and had these, these, these questions and answers to... What what does it mean in our county or our state, and what's the difference of our state from uh, other states? And what and these these men and women, when this was going on during the Vietnam War, we had these men and women and a lot. I mean, Republicans. It's, these are the same Republicans who brought us together in, in Levittown as little kids. My dad, most of those men couldn't get a job. But they were bringing programs together for, for, for baseball or, or little sports things. And mm-hmm. their, their wives were probably working. And uh, my mom, you know, was very highly educated. But then she got stuck with all these kids at home. Right. And my grandma had, had to help out. And he, you know, and then the GI Bill, I remember we got a brand new uh, car. And that was like so cool. I think it was a, uh, what was it? Oh, God. I, I just forgot. I remember the name of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're just like all these little and these pride, prideful moments with my dad in the suit, you know. Mm-hmm. And he looked like a Marine, and he probably looked like that his whole life. Six foot eight, and he's a basketball player. I remember once a kid, a young man. I didn't know he was a kid. He was like six foot six or something, almost as tall as my dad. And uh, he was police officers, and my dad walked up and he just nodded a couple of times. And he walked the kid, the young man, back to our car. And I was still only about five, four years old. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, son, get in the back. And he sat this this young man in the front. And we went. And what does he do? He, he wants us all to shoot baskets. He's a basketball. <laughs> he wants to shoot baskets with this kid. Yeah. And obviously this kid was just probably from across the road. The town right across the road. And what's he doing in our neighborhood? Right. You know, and I saw this over and over again at growing up as a kid. What's he doing in our neighborhood? You know, where where are you from? What are you doing here? And I heard those words. And, you know, these men and women, and a lot of them, I guess, dealing with issues that they fought for in the Second World and First World War, dealing with the rights of individuals, looking at their country in a better, in a different way, not better or worse, mm-hmm. but where's this belong for me now mm-hmm. and dealing with this among other men and women so you had differences among people then like we do now yeah right. and it is the same energy of people of republicans talking to other republicans and fighting mm-hmm. arguing you know and my dad was always quiet <laughs> he'd clear his voice and he just kind of move a little bit and he, excuse me yeah uh, and he would try to get, and I saw this with other vets too, we were just trying to hold on to something inside. Just trying to speak 
clearly. Yeah. Well, that kind of brings up an interesting yeah. question, John. I mean, in knowing that your dad was uh, a military man and and you know very staunch and things and he, like that, how did he, how did he feel yeah. about your involvement with like the movie Hair? Because a lot of people kind of think of that as like a counterculture <laughs> piece, you know, well, love did you kind see of thing. The, did you see the movie Hair Hunter? Uh, yes, a while ago. Yes, I'm, I was. This is a, this is a blessing. This is the kind of stuff I've had in my life. I never expected to be a, any kind of success in this world. I thought maybe I'd get in some theater. God bless. <laughs> you know, I, I never thought I'd be able to afford kids. I had them young, mm-hmm. and next thing I know, I'm working in bars all night. I'm going to drama class. I'm doing this, and then next thing I know, I'm doing off Broadway shows for like ten bucks a night. Right. Um, and next thing you know, I'm singing in a nightclub because. A teacher I had as a kid, <laughs> he was wow. a vocal teacher and his wife, an uh-huh. Italian couple. They were dealing with people in, in, in the arts, and he trained me. And he had me singing in a nightclub. And uh, uh, next thing, I'm in Fiddler on a Roof on Broadway. And I, this wonderful, and I get this play later in life with, with Robert Duvall and Kenny McMillan. And uh, the American Buffalo. Right. And, and, and you and you were kind of called upon by Robert De Niro for Deer Hunter, right? I mean, he really thought you were going to... Yeah. Yeah. That was a gift, too. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm an actor that done some TV and, and stuff, when I, but I grew up in theater. And the next thing, I got these two great directors, and Robert De Niro and but and and, uh, and uh, Milos Forman. Right. Yeah. Now, Milos Forman... I had seen his Czechoslovakian films. I watched foreign films with subtitles because I was learning how to read, mm-hmm. watching that tiny black and white TV. I, my, I had a grandma and a mom. I was sick all the time. I was at home all the time. They had me reading. They mm-hmm. taught me how to read. I was reading when I was three. You know, I was reading these words of these movies, and I saw his movie along with Italian movies like Città Alberto Roma about the Second World War and these great people in Italy and other places really struggling. Not all, we weren't always in the good side, in a good place though. We bombed the hell out of Europe, bombed the heck out of Italy. Right. And a lot of these people, when we came marching in, or we came rolling in with these these beat up GIs, they brought them flowers. They brought flowers to the Americans in Hungary. I remember my uncle had to go and deliver something to. Uh, Deberson and uh, you know with this, the uh, uh, some of, some of the military over on the other side with paperwork from Eisenhower mm-hmm. or something, and he was on two jeeps going across Hungary, and he said people would come out and throw roses. They thought the Americans were coming, but the Germans were still strong there. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are stories that I grew up with as a little boy, and he- this idea of me going into the movie, into the movie here. Well, he didn't say anything. He came back. They, he said, I would love to have a beer with you. Let's have lunch tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, oh, sure, okay. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what was going on with the movie Hair. Mm-hmm. Hair. Me? I went to see that show like 15 times. Right. And I walked out of it. Because for me, it was an insult. Right. But it was incredible, the music. And it made me cry. Yeah. These children, these young people, at that time, I knew these people. And a lot of them were dropping out, but they were smart. They weren't stupid. They were not just smoking dope like Jeff, Jeff Miller was not. He never touched booze or drugs. Right. He was a brilliant young student, and he was dealing with new energy, you know, and also thinking about the planet. Yeah. You know, a lot of these people, you start talking about that, and people start laughing at you. In, in knowing that you were concerned mm-hmm. over the way uh, the so-called hippies were portrayed, I really no, think I your character... I didn't know... I didn't care. I didn't care how they were portrayed. For me, the word. First of all, I, I was familiar with beatniks. Yeah. Right. You know, my parents were Republican conservatives, and they knew all about great the great writer. Uh, what's his name? Who was you know in the fifties writing about traveling across America? But Jack Kerouac. Jack yes, Kerouac. Jack Kerouac. You know, yeah. they gave me that book. He was all excited. Oh, you got to read this. This is a conservative Republican. You know, this is art. This is his life. These are young people with spirit, Mm -hmm. looking for a new path, something to contribute to their country and enjoy their country and and reflect their enjoyment of it. And also the gratitude. These people served in the military. His dad served in France. A thousand people died from gas in his platoon. A thousand men. 
killed. And he, I asked later, and I got a little lost. Grandpa, how did? Because my dad brought him to live with us. Because his wife left him for a very rich guy and left him to bring up my aunts and uncles and my dad. And he did, but he was an alcoholic and my, he drank a lot. But he was, he was, you know, he took care of life. He took care of things. Right. And I asked him once. My dad went to get him because once everybody went into the Second World War. My aunts and my uncle and my dad all went in the military. My grandpa supposedly just sent or sent or sent him a letter or something and said, just, just take the house. You know, I'm I, I'm not going to look. For, I don't want to know what's going to happen. I'm going to the Bowery. I want to die. Just leave me. Leave me be. Yeah. Well, my aunt knew where he was about. My dad brought him to live with us, and he was a humble guy. He was yeah. very calm. He was very quiet, and a little. You know, he was. He was very ashamed of a lot of what maybe he had, had done, but he sat quietly and my dad gave him respect. Remember, my dad was six foot eight. Yeah. My grandpa at the time would also, the whole, my dad's whole family were athletes, champion swimmers, poor. They had no money, but they could run on the track team, they ran, played, my dad was a champion basketball player. He, he introduced me to some of his friends, uh, some of the African American men that he knew, who, and who actually, the women helped some of the colleges open up. And any man who was in the military was given this opportunity to go into some of these all women schools that now became uh, co-ed. And when I'm, you know, and I met these men and women who were all different cultures and race, and some of these big guys, he played basketball with when he was a little kid. Mm -hmm. Or he taught him how to swim at Jones Beach. He was a lifeguard as a little, as a young kid, he was a lifeguard. But then the, the idea of playing a hippie you know, I said, I can't do that. I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> I, maybe you I didn't just, really have have an idea what a hippie was coming from another country and doing the... Oh, no, no, no. He had this feeling. that I mean, He had the images there. And he knew, and I knew he knew from his country what it was like to go to the occupation of Russian, without Russian tanks. Mm -hmm. He knew what young people were going through. I mean, people were literally... You don't talk about how violent that got because it looked really pretty much just tanks coming in. But you got people crushed if they stood in the way. Right. You know, it's simple things. Young people do stuff. And people were just shocked. Uh, people were taking up, families were broken up and hungry. And he said, you know, I said, I want you to do this. It, there was the sense of the spirit of America in the story. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, he said, well, what do you want to play? And I was like, what? He said, well, what do you, how do you want to play that character. What do you mean? Well, you know, if he, uh, if he's not a hippie. What is he? I said, well, maybe he's just a regular kid from a farm out in Kansas. Right. So he said, okay. Shit. <laughs> Excuse my language. <laughs> no, that, that's exactly not. I'm not saying the movie was shit. I'm saying shit as far as the feeling. Oh, it gave me that yeah. whole ending of the film where Treat Williams takes your place and winds up dead and you're standing at the gravesite with Beverly D'Angelo and everything. It was powerful. You know how it's like the deer hunter, the same thing. There was so much understanding just among all the people involved. Yeah. Their own personal it's like it's like having a faith. For me, faith is personal. You know, you might have an organization or something you're involved with, but you have to have that in your heart. Right. The way you feel it. And it's Wow, you know, it's it's why education. I mean, you find things that you know. You sometimes as a kid, you just find things that you have to, and you can't. Eat. I'm sorry, somebody wants to talk to me. Hold on. Oh, excuse me, Shuli. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wait for. Uh, okay. She had something she wanted to show to me. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I just she didn't realize. I don't think That's so. Okay. This this is okay. No, yeah. you had you had mentioned uh, you had yeah. mentioned John the, little, yeah. the, the deer hunter a couple of times. I mean, at the time, I mean, you were kind of a, a newer actor to movies. What was it like working with you know humongous actors like Robert De Niro and Christopher Walken? I mean, they're intense. I think I portrayed how I felt in my character. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I was like so impressed with. Oh my God! And the people around me. Oh gosh! And of course, how many young men, as a little boy, I met who had served, right. and 
there's, you know, and I, you know, they, they were young. As I got older, I realized there, there was a lot of them still in, in uh, recovery mm -hmm. uh, because they lost their legs. Right. And I'd also gone through polio, and I was in an iron lung. And uh, at the time, it was like the flu, right? Uh, people had the flu, or children. And then when all their parents started getting it, or brother or sisters, who became seriously affected, thank God California had this one development with uh, iron lungs, like the uh, oxygen things they have now, right. but those iron lungs were life-saving. And, you know, uh, I spent a long time in one. And I, I also worked on my reading upside down. I looked in a mirror and I, I you know, I worked in any time I was in one of these con confined areas, I worked on my imagination and my relationship with a power greater than myself. Right. So, you know, boy, I, I really, you know, I, in trouble sometimes when you get such great opportunities and things in your life. Well, you know, you know, everybody talks about your big films, but I've got to mention one of your your smaller films, only by distribution and and release, uh, more of a low budget film. But I thought it was incredible. Uh, it's a movie that we saw last night. It's called The Killing Kind. It's the Killing Kind, and oh, you play a mentally disturbed young man. Yeah, I was very young. It's my first film in in Hollywood. I think before yeah. I went to go, I got to go to Kansas with Jeff Bridges. <laughs> Those guys, bad company. Mm -hmm. But the great feeling of working with, you know, I, I, I got to talk to, uh, you know, I, I, I had always admired, and I met people in the actor's studio in New York, and this, of course, is brilliant actress. Uh, Ann Southern? Uh, Ann Southern. Mm -hmm. I mean, I watched movies that she'd made when she was very young. Yeah, she was a I'm TV legend, yeah. TV yeah. movies. And just those old black and white movies are classic. Yeah. That I think Tomb of Classics has a lot of them. And the, uh, you know, as a young person growing up, these are idols. You know, these are people. Yeah. They they are the character in the stories, and they will always be them. There will always be the characters you watch, and uh, just the stories that go along with it. So, it's it's you know it's fantasy land, and uh, the young actresses that were in the film. Well, I've got to. I've got to say, John, I am so envious of you that you got to kiss Cindy Williams because <laughs> <laughs> Cindy Williams is so cute, and we had her on the show, and she's a very nice lady. Yeah. And believe me, I am so intimidated by beautiful women sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I would totally respect. You. I can't tell you. I, I just, you know, uh, I'm I just sometimes I, I just get a little un, not uncomfortable, but. Uh, you know, you're doing a movie, and you know what is my what am I what is my purpose now in this film? And I've been with great actresses where the, you just and beautiful women where you you really get the best work. Right. You know, being open to that that other person, man or female, male or female, but you discover the moments in the script, and you can uh, with the comedy you can find character that. Oh, you know, I didn't realize I was so uh, slow or so kind of dumb. And just listening is kind of funny. Well, you, you, know, <laughs> you know, having your father be in the military, you're used to that. You've done a lot of military-type roles, and you know what that whole thing is about. But in this movie I was talking about with Cindy Williams, where you played a mentally deranged young man that just got released from prison and started killing again, where do you draw that from? Because you're so stable and so, you know, not crazy. <laughs> Well, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot you discover after being in, uh, you know, quiet little areas where you're secluded from contact for years. There you go. Uh, direct contact. Your imagination, your horror, your anger, your stuff. You know, you don't have the discipline in areas yet because you've, you've lived as a, a, a voyeur you've watched mm -hmm. and you've you've had you know the wonderful imagination to get to really get your place but in real life you know even now i just uh i have to be uh, very careful uh personal areas no, and i can't sweetie sweetie, sweetie I'm, on, I'm in an interview 
Yeah, okay. I'll see you in a minute. Um, we have a pet, and she's, she wants me to come over and talk to our bunny. Oh, okay. I don't think... <coughs> well, before... No, we share... Yeah. Before we wrap this up, John, I did want to uh, mention that you had quite a few projects that were recent. I know you had told me that you were very proud of. Uh, can you tell well, our, please, our listeners a little bit about some of your more recent projects? Please, if I go tomorrow, these, these are the two that mean, mean more than I can, I can say in a few words. The last full measure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, it, it may sound repetitive, but it's the recovery after service uh, in, in true stories of people who served uh, the Vietnam War and you know I saw this after my dad's service and losing a squad um, I don't know anything about that stuff I've never been in the military right but the idea that uh, you know going to I, I, I do go to recovery for myself with meetings with the people um, and the military has taken me to their uh, areas of recovery for uh, you see similarities in our lives, maybe, um, where I, have, I am able to give some uh, support. And the, 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 uh, just the, uh, the chance to do these last two jobs, one after the other, uh, this true situation which occurred in Vietnam was overlooked by our government and everybody, but the men and friends and family and children and people related to these people who did this service and sacrifice in this, this situation, one of many very bad situations. Mm -hmm. when the police action, as they called it, starting with the Korean War. Um, those those efforts with military action now are different than big wars, than the big world wars, and they're difficult for everybody. And it took a long time, and it follows it so well in the film. The last full measure of devotion is the hymn that the title was taken from. Uh, Lincoln quoted that in the Gettysburg Address, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, just the, uh, the 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 way. Um, they, they tell the truth of these simple areas of personal experiences throughout uh, the years of uh, family and other people so well. And yet it came all the way up to just a few years ago uh, when it was finally resolved and the award was finally given by the very survivors. In the film, we're in the film in the last scene as part of the real survivors of this incident were part of it and the in the dress the, you know dressed down or actually the, mm -hmm. the wonderful uh you know wonderful uniform that was for dress up actually they say and uh with the actors that were involved of the award that was given to this one young young man who wasn't supposed to be in the helicopters going in that direction because it was too dangerous overhead the 600 men being blown away down below mm -hmm. and these two choppers from air force got a call and didn't get the, the man not to go over there for dangerous uh, uh airspace and he says i gotta go down uh, the uh, the medic is out they don't have a medic and the senior officer board says no 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 he says no i got to i, I i'm a medic i can deal with him and he lowered the kid and our young man and he's been back he was 22 mm -hmm. or something like that and he ended up six six wounded in a basket mm. while he's been shot at. And men are going, bombs are coming in because the artillery 50 miles away right. is being organized to go in there with coordinates that have to be specific. Right. This is the craziness of war. They, I mean, their enemy was 20, 30, 40, 50 yards away and in trees and in tunnels. And they're, and they're having to order eyes on artillery they're being demanded what's your coordinate give it and i mean the situation was insane and this young man saved 60 men well that, that, that's something i definitely got to see and, and then the other film that, that you thought was really great that turned out well too so this this the tv series of uh of seal team i, yeah. I have to also say what's happening now it's happening today in afghanistan pakistan and these young men and women women 
I've been in the service now, active duty for over 20 years. That's basically that's basically what I wanted to, to kind of wrap this up with because you've been around a long time, and you talk about civil strife, you talk about the protests back then and the Vietnam War and everything. Do you think history has kind of repeated itself? What do you think about the way things are today? I, you know, I could get pretty serious if you want. Go for it. I'm only 71 in a couple of days, all right? So I'm still trying to get more mature. <laughs> you're, you're a young guy compared to most of the people we talk to. You're a young guy. It makes me sick. Yeah. It makes me sick. My dad, when I called him about my friend getting shot at Kent State, mm -hmm. he said something similar to that. John, just take it easy. Like he's put, he put his hand on me vocally. Just be calm. It makes me sick. Yeah. I'll call you back. Yeah. You know, he was a, he was in the service. He saw men die. He lost his squad. But a student being shot on campus by National Guard, the National Guard themselves has to be dealt with. It, it, they're young people being ordered to shoot their own people. If we have this attitude that we have now going on in our country, this is worse than civil war. Yeah because people are not even being killed. I mean, they are being killed, but it's it's like, it's not real, it's in the papers, it's where is it, who is who is who? We are Americans. This is a challenging time, we need to work together with good leaders, with science, with adapting to change. You know, we right. have thousands of people whose communities are falling apart, and it's even worse now. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to get your friends together, pack up some boxes, and go to those communities. Right. I think we You're should get. To, I think we should get John Savage to run for president. How about that? I'm I'm too out of control. But the <laughs> idea. Is, I mean, I took that name Savage because I couldn't use my legal family names, and it was the way I felt about the politics. Yeah. Right. You know, what you, when you're dealing with Native Americans that get wiped out, don't they deserve more of recognition for what they have to offer to? Yeah, you fight a war and then you make up, right? That seems yeah. to be the way the thing always works. But those, those people that carry that hatred and really hateful of differences. And there are people that just don't get it. I mean, I, I look, I've been to Germany, a beautiful country. They have some incredible people over there. You know, look, there's, 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 there's a desire for a future. And this rich, rich, beautiful, wealthy country, um, which has, de dealing with incredible challenges in Europe. But the idea of this, this husband and wife, they're, they were maybe over in their 80s, but they looked so stately at this beautiful horse fair, yeah. the most incredible festival for horses in the world. They bring countries all, all together in Germany at this place called Aachen. And it's it's a thousand year old festival. I mean, the very town where, uh, what's that great leader who's made the, uh, the uh, Pope of the West in Europe? Uh, oh, I forgot, but I'll remember it. And he says to me, John, and he's a gentle older man. He says, John, I, I'm, I'm, I am not, I'm not against the differences in people. I, I am not extremely right wing. I am just concerned about our culture. Right. Right. And that sentence went right through me. Yeah. No. For for he sure. Was, yeah. I understand. We should be concerned about the future of people who are living together in our communities, in our country, you don't kill them. Right. No. You don't disallow them to come together with their children. You, you are, we are living on with neighbors for years. The Spanish language was the second legal language of this country when Europeans took it over. Spain came here, but we had indigenous people that were being wiped out by disease. And people came from Spain and, and were integrated with those families and had big ranches from California to Texas. But then 
some of these people who just for whatever reason started burning those ranches started killing those people why so people with money could take it over right right or wrong there was no more question the whole history behind the alamo was interesting and it's like people who are humble people fighting for each other to kind of defend themselves from this onslaught which is caused by who others in their community forcing the people in their community out because they're different yeah it's not gonna it's it's not i mean we people who really understand this country do not want to judge each other on anything more than the character of their of their person of their even nice i meet homeless guys they don't drink anymore or for 30 years they just have gotten unable to get off the streets right, right. and they're smart and there may be a mental illness somewhere in there. I haven't detected it. But they, well, do, they, yeah, they talk clearly, probably clearly to me. Thing, things were, were pretty bad back in the days of, of you know, when, when they made hair, and things are pretty crazy right now. Do you think things are ever going to get better? There is a presence of goodness now. There is a presence of hope now. It's, you know, it's heartbreaking when you see people with a really good intent put together this democratic like thing, and I mean, you, I know I could tear it apart because I start playing my conservative, my, oh, I won't even say conservative because be, it, whatever is going on now is not from the conservatives. Mm-hmm. I know conservatives; mm-hmm. they have more sense than right. what's going on. And the idea of people with sense coming together, making better decisions, choosing to follow examples of demonstrated scientific proof we can make changes with leadership where we we take care of our food we take care of our energy we take care of ourselves and others to to go forward with our children this is backwards right. you can't you know what i mean when i say this i mean the other side of the coin of the desire for compassionate integrated effort and when integrated means sure you can live in your own community but man, if you're not going over there to have dinner with friends every once in a while, you're 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 doing something wrong. Yeah. You are this is that neighbor that lives right across that major road who is of a difference somewhere to what you're living with. I mean I see you know, I see even in South Africa, man, poor white farmers can't hack it. This this climate change is destroying people in our own country. You know, they, they're moving into the the, the more in, the, they're integrating those very sh- strong black communities that are not rich, but they are compassionate. Right. Yeah. And you have mixed nations of blacks in those communities. So there's mixed Portuguese, there's mixed white Afrikaans, there's English. They're moving into. Right. You know, and they they are finding the way to to get it together. You know, they have to, and it's not easy. I mean, as you see a farmer with the, one of the biggest ranches in, in, I forgot what state, but it's right here, right next to California. The storm that hit there flooded higher, up to the roof. Yeah. A thousand cattle dead. Farm destroyed. That's not, they're not going to be able to pull that place back together. Right. And well, I, I know you <laughs> mentioned Africa, and, and I guess you actually worked with Nelson Mandela against apartheid and all that, and that's something well, to be proud of. Well, people looking for, for the community yeah. there. Uh, a Christian group, well, you know, World Vision, and there were many groups: uh, Hindu, uh, uh, Jewish, uh, Muslim. The communities are all scattered down there, and the people uh, really have wonderful, you know, efforts uh, wow. for years, for years, to you know, with children with sick, malaria, AIDS, other stuff, you know, and they're dealing with it. It's not easy, oh. and we we have the richest country in the world, and right now. It's it's just wrong, you know. Right. We we've got to open up and get that. What is this need right now for connecting to the facts? I mean, I hear people man, laughing at the disease because hey, only a couple hundred thousand are dying. Okay, I see. I got to take the rest. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't. So. No. It doesn't. Well, take care of yourself, John, and I'm glad to know that you guys haven't had any fires this year. I know you still live in Malibu, right? 
Well, our place burned down. Oh, geez. Oh. I didn't know that. It was only beginning to try to bring that, that back together. But my friends up north, mm. uh, here, like a few miles from the same area, they're already involved. they've already lost two places they had, two homes. This was, this, and, uh, this was last year, John? Uh, my place was two years ago. Oh. I mean, oh. uh, when the wolf is wow. I think that was two years ago. 2018? Or am I wrong? 2019? Yeah, 2000. I think it was 2018. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're currently involved in a lake fire, and it came two and a half miles from us, but luckily it turned the other way. Oh, so it, it's rough. I hear terrible things. You know, that is, that's how many fires is actually going on? I think they said like on the, the news yesterday there was over two dozen active fires in California right now. Only two dozen? Yeah. <laughs> 11, 1,100 uh, lightning strikes that caused fires. Yeah. yeah. 1,100 at least lightning strikes. This is, uh, we're, we, you know, I mean, the, the governor said some things about we can't deal, we can't let these things go. We have to begin to prepare. Yeah. This is our world now. Yeah. It's not going to change. It's going to get worse. Right. So what do you do? You start to prepare for it. Yeah. And how? I don't know. But we need that kind of scientific leadership. Uh, I know people are, you know, very politically committed in some of these uh, groups. Uh, and gosh, you know, I wish I could explain to this farmer, he will vote for Trump again. Sir, we, we need to understand, you need help. Right. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt had the ball, excuse me, he had the strength to really stand up for farmers, to be supported, to get them to use small, to start dealing with smaller acre, acres. Mm -hmm. Make it small, cover it with burlap, Put keep that water underground. Don't let the sun use it up, we'll give you uh, till in the onions, till the onions into the ground and then cover it with burlap. Bring nitrate and, 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 and some kind of soil back to what's been lost and overused. Right. And the very adjustment in the, in the land and the use of the land brought a different climate. Mm -hmm. Clouds, moisture collected and came back in from the mountains or rain in the mountains, brought water back down in streams. People's the earth became enriched again, but a lot of farmers left. Yeah. Right. You know, cotton fields are still sitting down there with wheat. Um, it's all going overseas. So all this smartness sometimes we just gotta, like I, I have to do, like even now, is just stop talking and look <laughs> at my yeah. yeah, I don't want I don't want your wife to hate me too much, John. So I need to let <laughs> let you get back to her. But man, you've got a great mind, and I I love you sharing that mind with us and giving us your insight about the world because you, you really you know what you're talking feel, about. No, I, I get a little uh, self centered and overactive, and she won't show trying to help me to just calm down. She just gives me a look. <laughs> so, but, but I, that's I, look. I want I want to listen to your show more. It sounds like it's great. I'm gonna listen to Steve's thing. Okay. I was listening to you and I wish you both. I enjoy. You know. Well, hopefully here. someday we can do this. In, someday we could do this in person. That would be nice. Ah, uh, well, this is better. This is good enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, John. <laughs> Well, John, <laughs> John, I want to wish you a happy early birthday. I know it's coming up in a few days, and uh, thank you for spending some time with us tonight. It's been it's been a pleasure thank having you on the show. Thank you, thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Sir Terry. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. God bless you. God bless you. Have a great rest of your weekend. God bless you. All you right, Republican, Democrat, let's work together. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Thank you, John. Bye bye.